Oscar, do you have any um, lessons, any um, examples of targeted policies to offer from Sweden's feminist uh, experience? Yeah, of course, we have a lot of, lot of policies. I think you can never see trade as an isolated policy because this has basically to do how we organize our societies. Um, and look at the statistics when it comes to employment. In Sweden, the participation rate for women is 77%. In another country, a little bit south of us, it's only 50%. So it's big regional differences. And this is how we organize our, our family values, who takes care of the children, how do we treat our boys and girls in Which the kindergarten. Which is why everybody wants to move to Sweden. So it's, uh, no, it, and, in, and this has taken a long time. We, we have to admit that we had a rough discussion in the 70s, and now it's paying off in, in the 21st century. So it takes a long time. and. Uh, of course, I'm proud of where we are today. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm raising two daughters in Sweden, and I can say that they have far better access to education as born in the beginning of the 21st century than if they should be born in the 70s, like me. That's the government policy. But what about private sector? What would you say about the role of private sector in all of this? It's huge, and, and they are picking up. Um, and Look at the, who is running the, the companies. Still, the board rooms are looks very much the same as they did in the in the 70s. So we have to push them, in also showing that we can see examples from my ministry, Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, that companies and organisations which are gender balanced is actually having a faster growth than those who are not. So this is actually a sound economic decision to have gender balanced, ethnic balanced. Uh, age balanced organized work and but they are not taking the right decision as fast as we would like so we will in the end of next year 2016 do a new uh, survey to see if they have come up to the 40 percent limits as we think is a, is a sound limit when it comes to uh, boardrooms mm. Arantxa do you have a different perspective to this on the private sector no I don't I don't have any different perspective on that the private sector is a huge vector to support the integration of women and help them trade. Uh, first, because the private sector is market. It's markets. They buy, they sell. So it makes a difference when the private sector, say uh, a big uh, company says, I'm going to uh, make sure that 20% of my sourcing is from women suppliers. It makes a huge difference. Now, why are they starting to do this is the message we have to drive to them. They are, those that are doing it, they are doing it because it helps them. Because it makes for more diverse supply. And more diverse supply makes for more productivity. And more productivity makes for better uh, pay. And better pay makes for better jobs. So we've got to do a lot of um, education, pedagogy, over the value of diversity, which is what we, are, uh, what we are trying to drive through this. But the private sector for us is a huge, huge part of the answer. Jane, I'll come to you because in Kenya we have an example of this. We had a 30% um, procurement um, from women, but uh, as we all know, there's very little take up. Um, in your experience, how does this help if you have the right policies in place, um, but they don't work? Yes, I... No, it's not working. Just try it, let's see. Still not working. Yes, we do. We do have the, I, I, you're right, the 30% the, the procurement policy by Kenya government has not had an uptick because of the women are not properly trained to uptake it. There is need for training around, across the country, but the, the, uh, that has not happened. Um, those who have uh, pro, uh, those who have been able to win the tenders, they have challenges, uh, the payments. But uh, if if uh, the women will get proper information and proper access to these tenders. Yes, it will change. It will help the women earn more because government is the biggest consumer. 
and government is everywhere. So it is very important that those responsible, and I said that last week in a meeting, that it's very important that those who are, are entrusted in spreading the gospel, spread it everywhere, not just in Nairobi. It has to cut across the 47 counties. counties. And we are lucky to have the, the devolved government because then we can, we can sell, we can uplift the women in all these counties. Elspeth, I'll come to you and then to Arantia. Um, as a donor government, but also one that has um, tried um, to spread this gospel, what lessons would you then offer countries like Kenya, which put these policies down on paper and you know, have very little take up? That's, um, that's not an easy question to answer because there is always a big difference between policy and practice, and I think that's uh, uh, the added value of this seminar in particular, that we can exchange that and learn from each other. What we see in the Netherlands is that we, uh, we pursue a, a policy that is a combination of aid, trade and investment. So it's a tripartite approach in which the government, which is, as you said, Jane, everywhere, uh, closely cooperates uh, not only with the private sector but also with civil society. Because in this tripartite constellation, we think that you can be most effective, not only when you look at uh, the role of women in business and women empowerment, enabling women to make sure that they are used to their full potential, that their ambitions can be used to the full potential, but also ensure that um, uh, it is clear to businesses that women have to add something to the company, as Oscar rightfully say. We have to look always for this uh, perfect balance so that we ensure that uh, women in business is in fact a business case in itself. I think there are lots of arguments for that. And when we look at the lessons learned and the advice to the government of, of Kenya on the basis of our donor activities, but also on the basis of the activities we engaged in uh, ourselves in the Netherlands, is that Yes, there, it should not, there's no blueprint, as was mentioned before, uh, and we need commitment from the top of companies and government and politicians, uh, but also from the bottom up, because we are in this process together, and it needs time, and we need champions, like uh, you, for instance. Jane. So, okay. Jane, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's very important that we have champions and ambassadors who showcase what we can do in practice and that there is actually not an easy one but a bridge to make between the policy, the theory and the practice and the things we do on the ground. Mm -hmm. Arantxa? Laws make it possible, but you still have to make it happen. It's very important to start with making it possible because if it's not possible then certainly it will not happen but it doesn't automatically translate into realities. Procurement is a good example. We've been pioneering uh, for several years now, supporting governments to pass legislation to make sure part of this 15 trillion every year procurement market, of which only 1% goes to women-owned enterprises, goes to more than 1%. So we supported the, the passing of the laws, but then we quickly realized that the law was not enough. Why? Companies still need to be qualified. They need sufficient quantities in order to uh, supply governments. They need to deliver on time, and they need to be paid on time. Because if you're a small uh, <coughs> supplier, you can't uh, just leave on credit. So then we realize, in addition to the law, we have to put together first a package of information to the SME. Where is the trade uh, opportunity? We've created procurement map. 80 countries provide information on all their tenders so that all these SMEs know where to find it. <laughs> Two, we've provided an online training free of charge, SME Trade Academy, we call it, where companies can understand how to become suppliers to the state. So again, from making it possible to making it happen. Interesting. George, you wanted to say something. Um, the, the issue of um, policy and um, um, how policy is interpreted is also a very big issue um, because um, 
what we have noticed in, in, in our case is that the, the information can be available, but um, the, the stakeholders that we're dealing with would need to, to be made aware of that information. You need to take the information to them. To take the information to them. Then there's the bit of uh, um, um, having frameworks and, and policy, like in the case of SADAC. SADAC is a, a, gender, uh, a protocol on gender and development, which has been in existence since 2008. But then there's the issue of uh, political will and commitment. This is Southern Africa you're referring to, SADC. Yes, yes, this is Southern Africa. So obviously, at the end of the day, whilst you might have the policy, you might have the information, there is also the issue of making sure that uh, whatever is there is uh, made available. It's also um, uh, the governments, the companies, private sector, they, they're all committed to implementing uh, what is in the policy. Okay, political co commitment is something we know about here in Kenya when it comes to gender. Um, so the floor is open now. If you've got any questions or interventions um, for our panelists, what I'll do is I'll ask you to keep it short, sharp, and brief. Um, the microphones will come to you. Tell us your name, the organization that you represent. Um, and depending on the length of the question, we might take three questions at a time and allow the panelists to um, answer them at a go and then come you know, back and forth in that way. So Tom, you had your hand up. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tom Pengeli from uh, Sana Consulting. Uh, good morning to everybody on the panel. Um, my question is about um, not so much the role of government, but about the role of the private sector themselves as agents of um, this challenge of, of creating equal opportunities for men and women and empowering women through trade. And there's an international framework for that that was agreed through the United Nations and UN Women in 2010, and it's called the Women's Economic Empowerment Principles. And to date, I think, I've just looked online, uh, 1,100 companies have signed up globally. And some of the big companies, biggest in the world. Now, the funny statistic is, and this is why I want to ask my question is, um, <laughs> of the three countries we got represented on the panel, guess which one has the largest number of their companies that have taken on board that commitment? So out of Sweden, Kenya, and the Netherlands, which one would you say has the most companies signed up? Kenya. It's Kenya. So Kenya has seven companies signed up, the Netherlands has three, and Sweden has one. So my, my question is, you know, are these um, women's, the women's economic empowerment principles, the seven of them that UN Women set out, you know, is that something that we in, you know, in Europe should be getting our companies to sign up to? Or aren't they important? Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, any other question? Yes. Thank you. Um, we're done with Liz Young from okay, we can't hear you, so just hold it to your mouth and, and project a bit more, please. Okay. I'm Wenyang Godlis Young from the African Policy Center, and my question goes to Oscar. You talked about the age balance, like what are the particular policies that you put in place to ensure that there is age balance within your government? Thank you. Um, yes. Please stand up so that we can... Oh, okay. uh, morning, everyone. My name is uh, Beatrice Mwasi. Um, my question, I think, will be to Wanja. Um, Beatrice, what organization do you represent? A Center for Business Innovation Training. Uh, what I would like to know is... Um, what uh, women, especially uh, women uh, business member organizations, are doing to draw strength from within. As much as we are voting for policies and support from outside, what is it we are doing within? Through maybe aspects of mentorship, sharing good um, practice, are we having that, those kind of partnerships between uh, inter-country, maybe Kenya and another country? So basically, among women, what is it we are doing as much as we are pushing for policies and calling on everybody to come in and support us? Second thing is, I would like you, 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 you talked about uh, the 30% uh, policy that supports women and youth in this country in terms of procurement. What I would like us to do as women is to see it as a bare minimum, not a ceiling. We'd rather begin to operate without ceilings because the moment we start looking at 30% as the ceiling, it kind of limits our vision. We better move and think and operate beyond the 30% ceiling. Let it just be a bare minimum. And lastly, let us move beyond the middle level of the value chain. Uh, from yesterday, I've had discussions whereby we are talking about um, fashion being uh, pro-women, pro 
feminine, so therefore let us support fashion industry. But you see, the thing is, that is again what is limiting women because we tend to think that women are tailored for fashion, women are tailored for um, beauty industry. We should begin to think about the oil and gas industry. Let's think about manufacturing. Let's go beyond what we think is you know, socially right for us to operate as women. And when we do so, we shall start operating beyond the middle level of the value chain to the end the sides of the value chain where the value added is larger than where we are currently operating just in the middle of it. Thank Beatrice, you. thank you. A question and some inspiration. Thank you very much. Um, so let's, no, no, let's uh, take that round of questions first and then we'll come back to the floor. We see you. Um, and going, Wanda, you want to come in? Yes, go ahead. Adam. Am I? What yes, you are. Oh, okay. Fantastic. I think, I think um, I'd like to change up the conversation a bit just to answer his question. Could you speak up, please? You're on, but... Uh, you're Am I? Oh, I'm on now? But, but you just need to speak up. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'd just like to change up the conversation, especially just uh, in response to his uh, question to about the role of, of private sector. Um, I wonder how many people are thinking about the conversation of women in business as women owning the Uber of trucks of the tracking industry. How many people are thinking about women owning a WhatsApp, you know, or, or the Facebook, right? How many people are thinking beyond, you know, something that will, will, will change the world, the world around? The, the company that we have is, is I think we, are, we have two challenges. Not only are we in logistics, we're also in software or IT. So both ways we, you know, it's, it's not in our favor, right? Trying to introduce something new to, to the, to the sector by, you know, basically what we're telling people is you can find a truck online, right? And we're trying to say if your truck is on its way, if you're a transporter, your truck is on its way back from Eldoret and somebody has cargo in Nakuru, our system should be able to redirect that truck to Nakuru. So our conversation is how, what, what ceiling are you actually placing on women in business? You know, we can't be the Uber of a trucking business, so we can't be the WhatsApp. And then are your policies actually looking at women that are uh, targeting this kind of industries, yeah? So, Wanja, I'm going to interrupt you and change that around because I started by saying we have a woman-owned television station, um, airline, um, and uh, brewery. So, and, and now you're t telling us about this woman-owned um, IT and uh, you know, cargo firm. Um, in terms of policy, right, what do we need to do? I think look at, uh, I think when you're creating the policies, just don't create a ceiling. Meanwhile, don't so we say shouldn't that have it's, the 30%. It's not, it's not supposed to just be looking at policies. Okay, so if you look at most of the interventions uh, for, for donor uh, agencies, it's either in agriculture, right? And thankfully, Trademark is looking at logistics and innovation, innovation in logistics. But most of the time, you'll see we're being you know, kept So it's really not a ceiling, it's, it's the trade. industry. Have an industry-wide approach. It's have an industry-wide approach, but also allow for a different way of thinking and a different approach. Let the policies not be in what is traditional or has to be traditional, right? So look at excellence. Women, women can be excellent. Women are excellent. So let's not have that ceiling, even when you're looking at interventions for women. Thank you very much. That echoes some, someone on um, social media, Rehab, who said, you know, look beyond agriculture. Um, Elspeth, you had your hand up to um, respond to one of the questions. Yeah, I was. Um, um, uh, I would like to respond to uh, Tom's question uh, related to the Women Economic Empowerment Framework, um, and then, um, as a starter, refer to I think a very sensible thing Arantxa said: um, laws, frameworks, principles—they all make it possible, but we need to make it happen. And uh, I would say I would stimulate companies in Sweden or in the Netherlands or in Kenya to adhere to such principles, but there are uh, an enormous amount of other principles that make sense as well. The OECD guiding principles uh, that encourage companies and multinational organizations to practice decent entrepreneurship not only look at the profit, but also at the people and the planet, and then put into place also the gender lens. 
but also the UN guiding principles of Mr. Ruggi, who uh, asked governments to take responsibility as well as uh, companies to take their responsibility when it comes to a balanced way of operating, making sure that not only you profit as a company, but that the profit you make is equally divided amongst more than you alone, so that there is welfare and well-being, so the planet part as well, um, uh, distributed uh, across the board. So it's very important, um, uh, but let's not make it about paper and principles only. It's about the mentality as well. You need to have people think in possibilities. We can tell each other that uh, uh, women are able to do anything, operating airlines, being in logistics and transport, not, let's say, not only in beauty or in fashion, uh, but we need to show and we need to uh, bring that message forward. Thank you. Arantxa? I'm going to build on Elspeth's uh, point because I think we have a problem of perception. We have a problem of perception bias and the best way to address the perception is to get the facts and the figures right. So we've just done that with 20 countries. It's in this little report and guess what? Women are not only in textiles, in clothing, in footwear, in fashion, which they are, they are owners of computer electronics, consumer electronics, telecommunications. Guess what? Women are also in technology. We've just launched an app called She Trades. Guess who invented this app? It's two young Kenyan women. I might so know them. We have uh, Greenberg Communications. So uh, we, we have a bit of a perception bias, and we have to treat this perception bias. And the best way to treat it is facts and figures. A big, thick doses of facts and figures. Women in logistics, women in transport, women in shipping, women in electronics, in uh, technology, and the rest. And the list goes on. OK, thank you, Arantxa. Um Oscar, your perspective, because the question was for you as well. Yeah, a lot of good things has been said. Arantxa is, is right to look at the, at the facts, but uh, still there are too few engineers, female engineers, uh, in our universities, and there are, at the same time, too few boys uh, searching for healthcare and caring jobs. So we have to look at both ways, and this has to do with our prejudice, and it starts when we are small. And so this takes time. So it, it's, it's really both ways. I'm very optimistic when it comes to the E-Trade because it will take away a lot of the red tape it, with also all the intermediates which also kept the old structures on, on place. So uh, for the digital age, I, I'm, I'm sure that they will change. And uh, women are not excellent. I mean, they are far better than the, than the boys in the universities. It's, we look at the credits and, and the ratings. Uh, the females are out competing boys uh, from really the early days in school. And uh, the question which I got age straight balance, about the yes. age, yeah. I mean, it's, it's about uh, a simple thing that uh, all organizations, like the governments, needs a diversity also in age, in sex, in ethnicity, and in backgrounds. Because running a government or running a business is a, is a very complex um, business. And that's uh, why we, you have to take all the different backgrounds into into account, but not only on the top level. And that's why we always have tried to uh, prevent going into a quota system, because it's s solving the things on the paper, but not going into the heads and in the organization. But from what you're saying, it. though, it sounds as if there should be something to do with education and the curriculum. O of course, but I just finish on quotas. So we, we have a void. We have 50-50 in our, in our parliament without a quota because this is now inherent in all our parties, that it's common knowledge. Every, our <laughs> parliament will be better off if it's gender balanced. If, if you go for a quota, it will actually take away this mental thing. What about education, though, the prejudice, you know, the, the head? The, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, starts, it starts when we, how we raise our, our children. Only the knowledge, how are the teacher distributing the, the numbers of speaking times in the, in the classrooms? When we started to measure this in the 80s, we saw that teachers, even if they didn't know about it, they were giving they would give the floor to the boys rather than the girls. They thought that they were not having any prejudice, that they were treating boys and girls equal. But when we starting to look at the statistics, it was, it was balanced. So we have to, uh, to be aware 
that, that this is a very complex thing. And that's why we need to have smart policies to overcome. Okay. There are looks of horror on the panel. Um, Lisa <laughs> and then Jane will go to the floor and then come back. Okay. Um, Tom, on the, on the UN sign up. I mean, it's very encouraging to hear that Kenyan companies are the most, but we do know that, uh, as, as in a lot of African countries, sign up doesn't mean implementation. So um, it will be good to see how that moves forward. But um, I think on the question that this lady over here asked, you know, what are women doing? There are a lot of initiatives. East African Women in Business Platform that we support looks at um, you know, how they can encourage um, changes in the business environment so that women get greater access to funds, that they have greater, uh, you know, they have their feet under the table when we're having policy discussions and so on. Um, and there are a number of organizations that we can point to. But I think you're very right when you say we don't want just to be hairdressers um, and so on. Um, it's, it's about listening to women and this is something they keep telling us. Please don't just think we're all mum and boggers. Please don't think we're all just informal traders. We want to be up. In, you know, we want to be competing with men at the same level. Um, so it's about innovation, um, it's about taking initiatives that are not the standard initiatives. It's about being on the ground. So, you know, our analyses can show one thing when we're sitting at a desk. When we go out in the field, sometimes we're very surprised. Um, and so, as, as one just said, you know, using innovation so that we can work with a woman who's, who's going to be a leader in the logistics industry one day and will be the Uber of trucks. This is the kind of thing we're looking for. And I think that sometimes we, we and, and obviously a human rights approach, and with my human rights background, I support that. But I think we also need to make the business case for women, and that's the, that's the missing middle. You know, that's where the private sector really wants to see the business case. And even as donors, we, there's a business case for it where it makes sense to invest in women economically. And we really have to start talking about... Spell it out for us, e because e not everyone is convinced. Um, women politically in Kenya are still having to fight for their space. Yeah. So, so make it clear for us. Well, I think um, part of it is actually, you know, pushing the idea and, and, and making people understand that when, as women grow, um, the economy will grow because there's a spillover effect with women. You know, it, it doesn't just impact themselves. Um, you know, as they say, you know, when Kenyan men make money, the bars make money. But when Kenyan women make money, the children go to school and the, the hospitals um, are supported and the, you know, the communities are looked after and the aged are looked after. So I think it's about making that kind of social and economic business case. Um, to the policymakers, but to our environment and to, to our societies. As East African women, at all levels, um, there are certain things we, we, we have in common. Time poverty, mm -hmm. particularly balancing you know, your family and work, um, and you know, people having a certain perspective of you. But uh, there are issues that look at really very cultural issues, I think, as uh, Jane mentioned. Um, you know, we have, we've supported women who have managed to buy their own homes, to buy a piece of land, to now diversify into something else. So these are the kind of things, and, and this impacts their society in an economic sense. And so sense. you're reinforcing what President Obama said when he visited Kenya, that you can't play when half your team yes. is on the bench. Absolutely. Thank you. Jane, there's a specific question um, to you um, about how you are helping, um, you know, with mentorship, uh, sharing your knowledge and experience. No, no, you're mentoring, how you're sharing your knowledge and experience. Are you mentoring other women? Yes. It is working. Yes. Hello, hello. Yes, we, um, apart from being an exporter, I've also worked with the private sector, the business support organizations. Uh, that is uh, our one. Our one is African Women in Agro Business Network. And this organization, has been uh, through, have empowered women in various ways. One of it is the mentorship. We have a mentorship program in Awan that really mentors women on how to improve on their performances, how to uh, improve their products to become competitive in, their, in the markets where they are. And I, I, I want to say this, that every industry or ev every aspect of the trade requires innovation. It, it requires uh, information. It re requires that the members or the beneficiary are empowered in different ways. In our one, we need 
to empower the uh, association itself so that it can be able to create the necessary information that helps certain interventions. For example, we need to now be able to engage with the counties to know what are the uh, gaps that exist for women so that we can create the necessary, uh, the, the, provide the necessary assistance or, or facilitation so that women can advance. Um, I am thinking of being able, for example, to help an exporter who has come into, who interested in export. I want to be able to take them through the, the challenges. I want to mentor them, and I have mentored many, by the way, so that they don't have to start with the problems that I started with. I don't want them to go through the nightmare that I had preparing a shipment and it didn't go, or having to work with uh, borrowed funds or begged funds. I want to be able that, to know that there is a place where they can uh, go and get funds as startups. I want to know that they can have a long-term guaranteed credit. I want, to, I want to be able to help that woman to not only start exports, but also to live in the export, to, to build an export farm that will benefit many. So this classification is necessary. Who are we targeting with the initiatives? What technology, what information, what, what needs, who, who needs okay. what? Yes, thank you. Um, the fl floor, um, I think you had your, do you have the microphone? Yes, go ahead. Yes, microphone. My name is Alilian. I work in the Embassy of Sweden Somalia section. And my first comment was just to echo what Arancha said that the issue is very contextualized and very specific. And for example, in Somalia, you can, there's lots of generalizations about who a Somali woman is, which, which spheres they participate in, and so forth. But I think the, the cure is you have to do a good gender analysis to actually get the problem because you cannot treat. A, a, a disease that you don't know. So I think the, the basis is, is that we must analyze and see what, what are the current gaps in trade, um, I mean empowering women through trade, and then we, we, we really contextualize. Otherwise, we, we may never get, get it right. And then my second question, which is a bit provocative, is women, we are the majority in the world, and also we say that in Kenya we are also the majority, and in Africa, but why are we not really pushing our own agenda? Why is it that we have women parliamentarians, women leaders, we have opportunities, and we don't get it right? We keep blaming whoever, the men or policies, but what can we do as women to move our own, to have things going right? Because we can't keep saying that women have barriers in trade, women can't go to school well, but we have a chance. If it's voting, if we are 52% in Kenya, why can't we vote our own president, I mean, a female president, and then the, hoping that she will understand the issues and then I, I was also worried about young women are usually subsumed under women. So when you say trade barriers for women, have we really looked at the fact that women is a, we are saying it's a homogeneous, we're not really breaking it down. We could have different age groups with different needs and challenges and interested in business. And my last one was... Oh, uh, that's a lot. Um, let's give the opportunity <laughs> to other people. Thank you. Okay. Yes, McKenna. Thank you, Edouard. Uh, my name is McKenna. I'm, I'm the gender advisor at Trademark uh, East Africa, working with Lisa. So I, I always get very intrigued when I hear about the Swedish uh, feminist government approach, uh, like Oscar was talking about. And George also mentioned that you can have the policies and information, but if you don't have that political commitment, then nothing gets done. So um, Oscar, I really wanted to ask whether you could tell us what are the three main things um, a government should be focusing on uh, to be able to get uh, that approach, because I strongly believe we can have these kind of conversations, but if it doesn't come from the top down, then you know we will not be making major steps. Thanks. Okay, and one final one here in the middle. Thank you. My name is Faustina Mani. I'm a grain trader. Um, You're a what trader? A grain trader. I, I sell zeros in, okay. in, in grains with, with better grains. Um, my comment is as follows. First of all, it's very obvious in East Africa, close to 80, 90% of women are moving grains from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania 
we're basically feeding Kenya. Um, secondly, just take a walk. Luthuli, you'll find um, women in business. They're traveling to China. That's buying, one of our you know, streets in the business district. Yes. There are women who are traveling to China, buying bathrooms, uh, into construction. So the reality on the ground is women are working and women are in, in trade. I think the problem is our approach. If you look at this, just take a, a consensus around here, those women are not here. So the mistakes we're making is as, as technocrats, we're coming up with the solutions and innovations, which may not be relevant. We need to go down and find innovative solutions that are practical and adoptable to them. Then we can, we can get them interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take that um, question that you had. Good morning. My name is Jag Naftali Magritte. I am from Belmont Registrars as well as the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Kenya. My question is basically to the other countries with the Chamber of Commerce. What, is, what are your chambers doing to support the women in businesses? Because mostly I have worked with women in empowerment programs. And the most basic thing that we have been saying is that women have been having the need to separate themselves from the men in order to create a space for them to take up leadership positions, for them to be able to do things like that. It is rare that you find women sitting in the same platform with men competing at the same pace. The other question is, I think was echoed on the other side with the issues of categories. In Kenya right now with the Kenya Chamber of Commerce, we are creating a development support committee that is going to work with women and youth. So the women who fall under that category are also going to be catered for. But I want to know, is it this happening in those other countries? And if it is, how is it happening? OK, thank you. Um, I'm trying to manage time so we can get as uh, many questions in. We have just about 20 minutes left, I think. Um, and so we'll start with you, Oscar, because there are several questions um, directed to um, the European countries. Yeah, I remember two of them, so I, I stay with those. Okay. We have a very active um, chamber in Stockholm, led by a female chairman, and uh, they're doing a great job, especially in tricky okay. countries um, around the, the Middle East and the Gulf, where really the female rights at the labor market is uh, endangered. So they are an important uh, uh, NGO for us in the government. The specific question diverted to the Swedish feminist government, what we are doing, we're focusing mainly on three areas and that comes to the rights, the uh, representation and the resources. So that's how we divide uh, the three pillars. And one thing that we are now obliged to do is to do a gender responsive budgeting when it comes to new proposals, which means if I'm proposing, which I right did a couple of weeks ago, go, a new export strategy to the cabinet, I have also to, to declare and to show how will these proposals actually uh, affect men and women. If we have a new proposal in the education sector, we have to break it down. I have to make, th make sure that my authorities under, under me have the resources to find statistics to show how will this affect men and women. 